Hi, Tabitha. <laughs> Whoever said hi to me, hi back. I can't see hi. you. It's Maria. Oh, hi, Maria. <laughs> Kathy, this is Tabitha. I'm just going to ask that it, it, it's your show now. You can go ahead and get started at your leisure. Okay, excellent. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kathy Spann. And I am the executive director of Jordan Area Jordan Community Area. Council. I wanna take this moment to welcome everyone that has joined us this evening for the safety forum with Mayor Jacob Fry, Chief Madero Arredondo and city council member Alondra Cano. I wanna send out a special thanks and appreciation to the planning team members of this forum. Don and Sandra Samuels, Alicia Smith, Grace Berkey, and Tabitha Montgomery. I wanna thank you community for joining us this evening. We listened, we heard you, and tonight is about you, the community. I wanna thank the board of directors and staff of Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association Corcoran Neighborhood Organization and Jordan Area Community Council. Collectively, these organizations are three of the oldest neighborhood associations in Minneapolis. We organize people, we share information and we create space for people to gather. Tonight, we have partnered to address the issue of public safety and the impact of violence, both short and long-term. Tonight is the night, the time is now. Our city is bleeding, our neighborhoods are under siege. This is your city, this is your Minneapolis. Tonight, you have chosen to take a stand, to ask questions and seek answers. At this time, I turn this meeting over to tonight's moderator, Tabitha Montgomery, the executive director of Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association, and she will lead us into a discussion and guide us as we have this conversation to ask questions and seek answers. Tabitha. Thank you so much, Kathy. That was uh, awesome. And I don't know if I'll be able to lead up to the guidance and the direction, <laughs> but I am gonna do my level best. I would like to say to everyone tonight, thank you again, many thanks for being with us. Ultimately, I'm just gonna attempt to be the timekeeper because you're not here to really hear from me. We are appreciative and grateful um, that the Mayor Fry and Chief Arandondo and Council Member Cano have been able to make time in their schedule to be with us tonight. And as Kathy said, our priority this evening, one of several is to ensure that the majority of your questions are heard as best as we can. Um, as a, an attempt to just kind of level set this space, we understand that this one meeting of many that have occurred will not necessarily resolve or answer all of your questions. Please know that we acknowledge that. We're gonna to attempt to hold that. Uh, there is no silver bullet in tonight's conversation. We want to make sure that we uh, uh, set the expectation that we respect uh, this process, that we respect those that have raised their hands in, an, in a position of being elected or appointed to serve the community. And it is never a problem when the voices of the community are simply seeking to engage and to look for clarity. And so we ask that you help us to hold that. Ultimately, I'm just gonna run through quickly what you can expect this evening. Um, ultimately, we're gonna start with our community voices or a, a smattering, if you will, of community voices um, uh, from across North and South Minneapolis to share a little bit of their story. We felt that that was a good place to start this evening um, from a, a community building perspective. We will then move over into some, a panel conversation with the, the leaders that I've already named. Ultimately, you should know that they've received uh, at least the questions that we're going to lead with tonight in advance. So we uh, believe that that will ensure that we get a lot of clarity to those particular questions. And then we will then do our level best after that particular section. There's about five pre-prepared questions that they received um, to open it up to community questions that we will drop into the chat one by one. 
um, you will notice that the only person that you are able to engage with in the chat is the host of the meeting tonight, who is Grace Berkey. She's our community coordinator over at Powderhorn Park Neighborhood Association. We're doing that in an attempt to honor not only all of our panelists so that the chat does not become more of a distraction for all of our attendees, which is yourselves. Uh, from there, after we raise a question, we will do our best to hear from each of the persons or each of our leaders that have a response to the question as posed. And there may be an instance where they do not have a particular response, or at least all of them may not have a particular response. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and get going. I just want to note that I see that Grace, which is it's difficult to do, um, to notice a chat when we're talking, but Council Member Ellison is present. I did indicate that I am aware that there are many notable people that are probably joining us this evening. Um, and it, certainly it's not our attempt to not honor you or to recognize you, but it would be very difficult to do when we now have over 260 participants. So please bear with us uh, as we work through this process. And with that, we are going to move into our Community Voices segment. Again, um, we are going to start with Adwe Pew. Adwe Pew is the board chair presently of the Jordan Area Community Council. She serves alongside Kathy Spand, and she's going to share just about two minutes um, of her view in terms of what a lot of this moment has meant with respect to livability and safety in the city. We have about five other community partners that will also share their voices into this space. And then, like I said before, we will turn it over to our elected leader portion. Adwe, if you could come off mute and please begin your sharing. Good evening, everyone, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, so, and I, I thank all of you all for coming. Um, when all of, after the murder of George Floyd and um, the city council announced dismantling and defunding the police, I saw it on the news because I watched the news a lot. Um, I called Kathy Spann. I was terrified. I said, it's about to be some purging going on. That's what I hear. Because when people hear defund, dismantle, they hear that we don't have no police. My next thought was, we need to pray. And I did. And I continue to pray because every day and every night, tentatively, since then, we have heard gunshots in our community. They come in the day, they come at night, they come all whenever. And I'm, a, it's not so much that I'm afraid to go out, I'm more afraid to be in my house because bullets I'm just going to jump in and indicate that Adwe had mentioned that sometimes she has some spotty cell reception. Um, so we're. Just I know. I know you couldn't hear me. Okay. <laughs> I'm aware. I'm, I, it shows when my internet is unstable. Okay. So what part did you stop off at about bullets not having any name on them? Correct. Okay, because bullets don't have names on them, and so my fear is that a stray bullet is going to come in our house, and somebody's house, and shoot them, kill them hurt them because it's not like it hasn't happened before. I'm getting, kept getting this feeling and my house on the next block on Humboldt, somebody did get shot in their house. And I kept, I told Kathy, I said, we have to do something for these people that these things are happening to. <clears throat> and we went and with the police, uh, the police officer uh, came, called me and we went over there and met him and I and had a conversation with the woman um, who was shot in her home. She was shot in her stomach. And I, you know, talked to her. Um, she said that she was, had looked out the window and that's how the bullet, it came through the, and it wasn't just one bullet, a couple of bullets came in her house that day. And I told her how sorry I was and how fearful I am that it's going to continue to happen. Um, and she thanked Jack and myself and the police officer for coming 
because the the trinket that we took to them is nothing in comparison to what she's the agony that she's going through. So from then on, from that day to this, every time I hear gunshots, I just immediately start praying because there's nothing else I can do. If I hear any noise, a sudden noise in my house, it reminds me of a gunshot. I, I, I'm, I, I started going to therapy again because of it. Um, and something has to give. We Something has to be done because we, as taxpaying citizens, as homeowners, renters, community people, we should not have to endure this. We should not have to live like this. And I'm saying something needs to be done and I'm not the only one. So I'm asking that if it's a plan, if it's a whatever we need to do to get something done in our community, I'm begging and pleading for you all to make it happen because me being angry is not getting anywhere, but I'm letting you know tonight that I am in fear for my life, my family's life, and the lives of our more community members that's going to lose their life, not due to the pandemic of COVID, but the pandemic of gunshots and violence, and gun violence in our neighborhood. Thank you, Adwe, so much for sharing. Um, I'm going to next ask if Stephanie Konebeck, who is a resident of Corcoran neighborhood, if you could come, thank you so much, and please begin to share your story. Hi, welcome neighbors all across the city. We're glad to connect with you tonight as well as leadership, so thank you. So witnessing the execution and murder of Mr. Floyd on our streets by our officers has changed our neighborhood. Uh, we have been meeting once a week on Thursdays um, since the uprising began and have been really challenging ourselves around the issues of police and justice reform, what does safety now mean? And I think one of the first points that's really come out of our discussions is we don't accept this dichotomy of either there's safety now or there's police and justice reform. We expect both. We are going to work towards both. And we expect leadership in both realms. We want all neighbors to feel safe now and expect that we have appropriate protection in place for everyone, as well as this transformational work to continue around police and justice. And also I wanna say for the neighbors of Corcoran, we wanna do the work, we wanna be engaged, we want to be part of this process. I have never seen more commitment from neighbors uh, to, to really engaging this change, having hard conversations. And we want to also ask our, our leadership to, get, to galvanize us. You know, what do you need from us? Um, how can we also be stepping up into this? Um, I also want to make sure that make sure to, to, to address that as you know, as we're going through this, how important communication is. So, you know, really understanding safety, and then also, does the city need us to be doing citizens patrols, etc., and also having real talk. We've had different members of the police department come and speak with us, and have oftentimes heard, "Oh, there really is no issue with um, lack of attendance or a shortage." But then, you know, the next day, there's you know, as of last week, a request for half a million dollars for additional additional police. We can handle the truth and we really want to have that sort of moment where the city asks us to understand what's going on. We, we understand the plan of what the plan is to do this transformational work, as well as have safety for our neighbors across the city. Um, and then how we can all engage it. How, how can we all engage in that work? So the, the neighbors of Corcoran, we all live very close to the third precinct. I walk by there every other day and think about this work. And it's six months since Mr. Floyd was murdered. We wanna make sure that we honor him. We take this paradigm changing moment and that we all work on this together. You know, this work is so much bigger than any one of us. So thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, Marcus, can you come off um, screen and please share? Thank you, Marcus. Oh, um, good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here with everyone tonight. Um, my name is Marcus Hunter. 
and I reside in the Jordan neighborhood in North Minneapolis. Um, and I'm 17 years old and I, um, witnessing the killing of George Floyd has perpetuated the void of fear that I have um, for the authority in our city of Minneapolis. Um, and um, I've had a fair share of experiences with the police. One of those being, um, one of those being pretty recent. Um, I was walking to the store for my mom and I was, uh, there was a, my, my sister and my mom had a doctor's appointment that morning. And my mom asked me to go to the store for her to get my sister a snack for the doctor's appointment because they woke up late and she wasn't able to eat breakfast. Um, so I proceeded to go to the store. And as I was as I was going to the store, my mom asked me to hurry up a little bit because she had a taxi waiting for her. So I I started to jog. And as I was jogging, about halfway to the store, a police car pulled up to the side of me on the curb. They got out of the car, asked me where I was going. Um, instantly, I instantly I just knew that there was no good that comes out of these situations. Um, so I, in my mind, I decided I made the decision to, you know, do what's best for me in this situation and to not um, have the worst outcome. So I told them what I was doing. I told them that I was going to the store for my mom. Um, they proceeded to grab, grab my arm, um, pull me to the police car, put my hands behind my back and my face against the car um, um, and proceeded to um, then search me. Um, and then after that, they asked me questions. I answered their questions. They looked, they searched me up to see if I had any, any, um, any charges on file. I hadn't had any charges on file. They let me go, said any, said nothing, but get out of the car. Um, these experiences, experiences like these really leave, leave scars, um, for not only me, but, um, our youth and our community. And I feel that we need significant change moving forward um, in order to better the experience of our authority with the community as a whole. Thank you. No, you didn't tell the other part. Marcus, thank you so much for sharing. And I know that every, I speak for everybody on this call when I say that we are certainly glad that you made it home um, despite your experience, um, which certainly is why we're all here tonight and I'll leave it there. I would like to invite uh, Kevin Kirsch, who is a Corcoran board member and resident to come off, come on screen and please share. Hi, hi, thank you. Um, and uh, hello everyone. Um, I maybe wanna just tell a little story from a neighborhood perspective uh, as, a, as, as myself as a white person and my neighbors are largely white. Um, uh, a few weeks back, um, someone, we're on a text chain and we talk about things that are happening in the neighborhood. And got, I got a text that so, um, someone tried to, to break into the house a few doors down. Um, and, and also that they had found a food container in their yard and they were alerting me to the situation that happened. And I I didn't want to panic, but I, I, I listened to what was happening and I, I thought about the house that was being bro broken into and it looks like it's under construction. And, um, and then I put two and two together with there's an empty food container and it's been pretty cold out. And what that, that brings to mind for me that is someone was cold and tired and hungry. And this is what's happening uh, when people are doing that. And uh, when people are in that situation and I think largely these are um, people of color or people who are hurting or people who are unhoused. And um, as a white person, largely buffered from a lot of these things. And too often I see 
uh, well-intentioned um, folks like myself um, turning to the solutions we already turn to, like the police, um, to solve these issues. And what I'm interested in talking about from a, a, a community safety standpoint is working on those underlying issues that puts people in those situations, um, puts guns in, in hands of people who are, are looking for outlets and maybe don't have them. And, the, and, and what are we doing to support those individuals? How do we help them? What types of interruptions from social service social services or violence interruption or what can we do to to interject and help people so that we aren't kind of turning to these same solutions over and over um, I, I would like to hear those stories of those people and elevate those stories uh, we don't hear them enough and i think when we do hear those stories um, that's when hearts will be moved um, I, i'm interested in in us Reimagining. There was a reckoning this summer, and I'm interested in, in a reimagining of what public safety looks like. Because if not now, when? Um, so, so thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Truly, thank you for being with us tonight. I'm going to now ask um, one of Powderhorn residents, Tim Anderson, um, to come on screen and share. Uh, hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tim Anderson. And I've been a resident of Pudhorn Park for almost 10 years. Uh, I live three blocks from 38th in Chicago and witnessed actually the murder of Jeremy Conley uh, outside my window, 6.41 a.m. Uh, on Juneteenth uh, this past summer. And like others have shared, um, I have a lot of questions. My neighbors have a lot of questions, a lot of concerns, a lot to process, uh, a lot of trauma, and we need some healing. And so thank you uh, to the elected officials and leaders in this room. And, and I guess I wanna start with, with a reminder that is helpful, I think for me certainly, um, that you're part of a really big system and really big systems are by design, not flexible. And really big systems by design do not have the ability to think outside of the box. And yet I'm here as an individual, but, but knowing others share this voice asking for your creativity and your courage to get outside the box, to dream in ways that the system won't allow you to dream because I am and others have shared as well today that the solutions in front of us, it's my opinion, they're gonna be found not in the system, but, but outside of it. And so with an olive branch in hand, uh, I, I make that invitation to you tonight. Uh, I'm a forward facing world outside of the box kind of guy and, and Here's a few ideas that have come to my mind and I'd love to talk about them. I'd love to dream alongside of you. And certainly these are things that the system says, we don't do this, Tim, that's not how we do it. And I'm here to say, let's dream a little, let's talk a little, let's have the conversation. Uh, the first is this, and, and Marcus already got to it. Marcus, thanks for sharing your story. Uh, if police are gonna patrol my streets, I want the ability and the control to hire and fire the police officers who are working my streets. Uh, adopting very common language that you see on police TV. Uh, if you've done nothing wrong, officer, you have nothing to worry about. But if that kind of stuff happens, like Marcus, you shared, that's a one-way ticket off our street. And I want more control and more oversight to make sure that we have the police officers that we want and we need on our streets. Two, I want to make sure the right people are responding to the right situations. Um, Officers have a very unique skill set. Um, some of those expertise are not in things like therapy, addiction, social work, reconciliation, counseling. And yet we ask, and this is something that we have done, we've asked our officers to wear too many hats and that's not fair. We need less resources in officers and more resources in mental health and community health professionals. When I witnessed the murder a few months back, send the forensics team, send the homicide detectives, that's fine, but where's the therapist, the community health professional asking me, hey, you just witnessed the murder, let's talk about it. How can I connect you with resources? That's where trust is built. That's where connection and community is built. That's where healing starts. Uh, and number three, and it gets back to mental health. I wanna make sure that the police officers who are responding to the appropriate calls are coming in a healthy, 
and in the right mind. Asking you to consider is to invest way more resources into the ongoing mental health of your officers so that when they're coming to situations that are unstable, they're at least coming to them with a stable state of mind. Like I do, like a lot of us do, y'all need therapy. And I say that with all due respect um, to pour resources into the ongoing mental health of our officers because the trauma work that you are involved in requires you to do that. So we need to move outside uh, our systems beyond good intentions because our good intentions are not good enough. I'm with you, I'm for you, and let's talk some more. Thank you so much, Tim. And the last person um, from our community that we're gonna hear from is Wayne Bug. He's been and is the uh, Associate Director over at the St. Vincent de Paul store off of Lake Street. Wayne, can you go ahead and share a little bit of your story, please? All right. Well, thank you everybody for being here tonight. Thank you um, all for, for listening. As I'm sitting here pondering everybody's thoughts, I agree with you, um, Tim, that some therapy um, is, is needed. Last night, as I sat in my home, I live four blocks away from George Floyd Memorial. I heard sirens and um, my mind just went back to that week when Mr. Floyd died and, and, and just thinking about all of the, the gunshots, the fire, the smoke, um, my baby's crying and me not having no answers for him. Uh, recently, I've had the opportunity to go to several places and talk about my experience. And I told them that if, you know, over this last year, just looking at COVID, George Floyd's uh, death, the unrest, the encampments, and the opioids everywhere, it seemed like we're part of some social experiment um, that people are just tallying up to see how much trauma can one community take. And at times it's overwhelming. Um, I live in a 10 block radius in between Lake Street where a lot of the unrest took place in George Floyd's um, uh, memorial. And, and, I, and I can't escape like every day from work to home. This is all I see is boarded up buildings, burned down and rubble. And so, um, so I would like to see just more of our elected officials show up. Um, after everything happened and the citizens were in the street and they were cleaning up the rubble, um, but I didn't see <laughs> the people that, that we voted in, the people that I believe um, care for us. And so I was speaking at one of these schools and a kid asked me, he says, uh, sir, wh why do you think this happened to Minneapolis? And, and so I said to the young man, I don't know for sure, but what if? What if God knew that we had the people and the capacity here in this city, our city, to prevent just injustices like this from ever happening again? That Minnesota nice wouldn't just be a catchphrase or a hashtag, that it will be evident in the lives that all of us live. And I believe the people here, as they were saying, they are ready, they're willing, they're ready to respond, they're looking for some leadership. So the question is, can we, the community and the government work together? I believe we can. I think we have an opportunity. I think we have an opportunity to lead this nation, to lead this world on what reform police and reform government look like. This vision should include people like Marcus, those who've been impacted by this. Give them a seat at the table. Mayor, chief, councilwoman, I truly believe this is possible. This is a legacy shaping moment. Together with your leadership and our support, these old antiquated ways, this system that Tim was talking about, they can be done, they can be laid to rest, they can die. And we can move forward with a new way of protecting and serving this city, it, that can be birthed. So I beg you not to let Mr. Floyd's death and the death of so many businesses, so many dreams be in vain. I know this task is not easy, it's not for the weak or for the feeble, but I believe by God's help and everybody else's um, uh, support, that our, our city can be strong and courageous. And then our, our kids, Mary, you talked about you just had a baby. Our kids can grow up in a city that when they hear the sirens, they will know that help is on the way. So I promise you this, that if you stand for me and mine, I'll stand for you and yours. So thank you all. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Wayne. Um, I'm not going to say it's hard to follow that because I think that that's the point. Um, I, I think that ultimately my aim tonight is to move us again through this conversation in a way that people get answers. 
And so this is just me saying in a very gentle moderator fashion that the only time that I will circle back on a question is if I believe that it has not been answered. It's in all of our interest that to the best of your ability as leaders that you attempt to do your level best to respond with as much clarity and sincerity as possible um, so that the people that's really approaching 300 uh, believe that they left here hearing your voice and not mine. Um, and with that, I would also encourage you to if there's a question that you don't believe that you're in a position to ask or answer or respond to, that's totally fine. Just please indicate as much. And then you can pass that to one of your other fellow leaders um, to respond to that question. Um, I'm gonna start with the first one. And again, these are the questions that you've received in advance, um, Mayor Fry, Chief Arandondo and Council Member Cano. And then I will basically call on you in turn um, to see if you can give us some insight into each of these. Mayor, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, the first question community is how would you describe the state of livability and safety in our community? What metrics are you using to understand where we are? Thank you, uh, Tabitha. Um, thank you, Powderhorn and Corcoran and Jordan. Uh, and, and Kathy and, and everyone who's joining, whether you're on the, the north side or the south side, I mean, the words that we just heard from uh, Marcus and from Adwe and from Wayne and, and Tim and, and all of you, I mean, that, they, they were powerful. And so I, I just want to start by saying I'm, I'm really honored to share this space with you. Uh, the, the state, uh, in terms of, of both livability as well as safety in our communities, I would say is raw. Um, we have seen an, an uptick in, in violence, uh, specifically gun violence and, and, and different forms of, of crime uh, throughout most precincts within the city. Um, we have had a number of crises, obviously, that have been sandwiched on top of, of one another from a, a global pandemic uh, to the killing of George Floyd and, and the subsequent unrest. Uh, and then there's everything that goes along with that. It's the trauma, it's the distance learning, uh, it's the lack of recreation, it's, it's, it's people's concern about their job, it's the mental and emotional and psychological trauma that everybody's going through right now, and it's all that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's important for us right now to, to acknowledge where we're at, uh, to acknowledge that, as has been stated, we need deep structural transformational change. I think it was Tim that said that, that you know, you're asking us to dream alongside you and I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it was, I think it was Wayne uh, that said that, that this, is a, this is a legacy shaping moment and, and it is. Um, and so there's a number of, and, and, and so I, I think it's, it's incumbent on us to get that deep structural change, to think outside the box, to get those aspects of safety beyond policing and um, also, uh, to make sure that we have the right law enforcement approach uh, and response. Uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm very much a, a, both, a proponent of both end. Um, I, I believe in that deep structural change, and I also uh, believe that we need uh, police, and, and the, re the response from police needs, needs to be dramatically changed. I know that the chief recognizes that, and I'm lockstep uh, with him. The, the second part of the question was, was related to the, the metrics. What metrics are we using to understand where we are? And there's no one single metric. I think this is perhaps a, the second part the chief can, can, can dig, dig in a little bit more on, on stats and the crime stats that we see uh, throughout the city, uh, but there's no single metric. I mean, there's, there's, yes, there is of course the crime stats and the uptick in, in violent crime, um, you know, but importantly, like a lot of the crime, in fact, some of the most violent crimes that we see don't happen on our streets. They happen in our homes in the form of domestic violence. Um, it, but it's not just the crime stats that we can put up on a dashboard. It's, it's also how people feel. It's also how they're impacted. Um, I mean, Wayne was mentioning just a second ago how um, the, the trauma of, of hearing sirens yet again. Um, hearkening back to, you know, the, the smoke and, and all of the difficulty that we all, and especially those along those corridors, uh, experienced following George Floyd's killing. 
Um, and so it's, it's, it's not just the, the kind of quantitative data, it's also the, the, the qualitative uh, information that we were all receiving from all of you tonight. Um, and so I'll, I'll turn it over to the chief who can expand a bit on some of the metrics that, that, that we're using and what we're seeing, but, but in all seriousness, thank you. You know, this has already been powerful. Good, good evening. Uh, Director Montgomery, thank you so much for, uh, again, uh, inviting me into this space. And I wanna uh, thank all of the speakers who um, really shared uh, their story. Uh, for young Mr. Marcus, I, I do want to uh, extend my apologies to you regarding the, uh, the encounter you had uh, with our Minneapolis police officers. Um, as the mayor just uh, indicated, um, we are, there's so many different um, uh, levels of, of trauma that our city residents and, and business owners have been experiencing this year. Um, Unfortunately, towards the tail end of 2019, uh, we were seeing an uptick or an increase in violent crime. And unfortunately, even during the winter months and when we started to get word of uh, this uh, coronavirus hitting our city, uh, that, that violence did not stop. And uh, where we sit right now today as a city, um, and, and I'm always very mindful that as I mention these numbers, um, I, I have to take pause to, re, to remind myself, and I think it's important uh, to share space, that these are individuals, either individuals that we've lost, uh, who are no longer coming home to their loved ones, uh, or who, because of the ravages of the violent crime that they've uh, had to endure, they will not be the same. Um, and so as we sit here today, uh, this evening, um, the city has uh, had 74 uh, community members who've died uh, as, as, a result, as a result of homicide. Um, and I wanna just note that back in the 90s when um, uh, infamously Time Magazine characterized our city as Murderapolis, we were at 98 homicides. So we're at 74 uh, as I, I sit here tonight. Um, we also have seen a record number of shootings that I have not experienced in my career uh, with the Minneapolis Police Department. We have over 500 plus uh, community members who have been shot and wounded by gun violence. And um, that is just, again, these are numbers when you think of the number of individuals impacted by this, it's just unconscionable. Um, our robberies have also um, been, and these, by the way, this is throughout our entire city. So there's, uh, while there are certain neighborhoods that have uh, been disproportionately uh, impacted, um, we have seen this across all four sectors of our, of our city. Um, our robberies, we are now having to um, look at those from both carjackings to uh, street assaults uh, because our carjackings uh, uh, this year have, have we've, again, increased in numbers that we have not experienced before. So as, as uh, in, in terms of just right now where the uh, violence that our neighbors are experiencing, um, it is at record levels. And um, um, I'm committed to doing everything that I can do uh, to stop uh, this violence in our city and, uh, and I wanna keep in mind also the conversation that some of our speakers have talked about before. Um, it's the both and. Um, I don't come in this conversation uh, uh, with fear. I, I come here to really inform uh, our community. And um, uh, I think we can do both. We have to do both. I, I think that um, through working with the mayor, his support with our, our, our neighborhood associations, our mutual aid partners, uh, we, need, we need additional resources. Clearly right now, when I say additional resources, not only in terms of the, the um, uptick in, in violent crime, but um, in terms of functional sworn police officers, resources that we had uh, from January 1st of this year to tonight, as I sit before you, uh, there's 172 less police officers on this department who are able to um, uh, to respond. And, and when I say that, they're, they're not a part of our uh, they're not able to act as whether they're patrol officers or investigators. And so that is a, that is a huge uh, deficit right now to our ability to, uh, um, uh, to respond to what we're occurring right now. And so that is why uh, through the mayor's uh, help and also with some of our elected officials, um, I've asked for additional resources to, to help us in that regard. At the same time, uh, I'm absolutely committed to transformational change of this department. That has been something that I 
uh, believe strongly in. Um, it needs to occur. And um, we're on the path of trying to create this new MPD. Uh, I listened to the voice of, of uh, young Mr. Marcus. We absolutely not only need young people at the table, but we need to have young people really directing our efforts as we try to create this, uh, um, this new MPD. Uh, Mr. Anderson from Potterhorn Park, I absolutely agree with you. We need to make sure, uh, uh, I appreciate Mayor Fry's support when I came into role as chief to talk for the first time about trauma that our own men and women experience. That has been stigmatized for so many years in this profession. Um, I've unfortunately, uh, uh, I've, I've had uh, an employee who took their own life to suicide. More officers in this profession that took their lives or from suicide than in the line of duty deaths. To Mr. Anderson's point, we, we know that hurt people hurt people. I need to ensure that our officers have wellness resources. Um, do they have those counseling uh, resources and opportunities, EAP and other types of assistance? And that can't just be from the first day that they come on the job. That has to be through the length of their career. And so I absolutely agree with you. And you should feel confident and comfortable as a community knowing that we're taking care, I'm taking care of my officers in that regard. So, um, so all of these are very important. We also, uh, when we talk about reimagining policing, um, uh, when I came into role, I was very fortunate to say, you know, what are some dollars that I can take from this budget that are not a sworn capacity? And um, I was able to come up with uh, community navigators who are, who are community members. They're, they're um, non-sworn um, uh, members of uh, the city who are bridge builders and, and really working in our communities uh, that have had challenges, have had difficulties, and, and, and that's, a very, um, that's very important. Um, I know that, as uh, this goes back to Mr. Anderson's point about we're asked to wear so many hats, but I knew that when it comes to those individuals in our community who are experiencing homelessness, that we are oftentimes the first face of government to have to interact with them. Uh, Lieutenant Grant Snyder, uh, creating the homeless and vulnerable populations, and he's worked with so many different social service agencies there. We will not, and, and the mayor absolutely um, uh, understands and is supportive of this, we will not criminalize those who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, but we know there's so much more that needs to be done with that. That is a huge um, uh, a task and effort. And I, and I know that the mayor is uh, leading the way in, in, in many efforts through that as a city. But we also know, I know as chief, we are oftentimes the first ones to come across those experiencing homelessness. And I don't want that interaction to be one uh, focused on uh, criminalization because it should not be. And so there's there's a lot that we are engaged in in trying to reshape, reimagine, um, dream bigger and better uh, in terms of how we move forward. And um, um, and I will continue to keep dedicated uh, in that effort. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. And um, th that was great. And this is just me wanting to do a small reminder that there are additional questions that we want to get through. And so just if you could just please keep that in mind in your responses, because we want to make sure we give each of you an opportunity to respond, hopefully, to each of these questions. Um, Council Member Cano, um, would you like to respond to how you, from your lens and your, and your role, uh, would describe the state of livability and safety in our community? And what metrics are you personally using to understand where we are? Yes, thank you so much for um, having us here to have this conversation together. I think that's really important. Um, I'm, um, I, I would say that my office has, uh, over the last uh, couple of months, um, probably four months now, been receiving an increase in uh, requests for um, supporting and helping our community in times of distress. Um, there, there are some some cases that have come up that I that I haven't seen come up in the seven years I've been a council member, which has been um, a little, um, you know, disheartening for me in in that it it seems like the 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 types of um, harm um, causing activities that are happening out there are uh, less predictable, um, happening at different times of the day or, or throughout the day. Um, I know that a lot of our, our immigrant business owners are really struggling and, um, and they feel like no one's listening, like no one is um, uh, valuing their experience or, or, or validating that experience and, um, and acting uh, on their behalf to make sure that they feel uh, safe and, and protected and cared for. 
um, which I think is is you know um, three three things that we should be able to provide for for everybody in our city. Um, so it has been a, a challenging um, summer, and and it's been a challenging year. I'm, I'm pretty sure that many uh, people would agree with that. Um, I have uh, personally uh, been keeping track of uh, different, um, both um, what, what you could call uh, data-driven uh, methods uh, to, to track what's going on with, with the uh, livability issues and the crime issues, as well as um, some more, what, what some folks would consider, you know, soft data or, um, you know, the experiential data, which is um, individuals who uh, either personally uh, call me or text me or send me photos or emails um, or phone calls to my office asking for help and support. Um, so, so those things have increased in, in volume and in, um, in urgency. Um, that's, that's been, that's been hard. And, um, and, you know, in, in my, I think most recent engagement with uh, certain city, city leaders, um, I just expressed um, concern that it, it just uh, felt like um, as a sitting council member, it, it, it didn't feel like I could help, you know, it, it, it's a very bad feeling when you are in a situation where people look to you for help and, and there's nothing in your toolbox that, that, that can really provide uh, that safety or security or protection that people are looking for. Um, so, so in some ways, um, you know, I think I, I use the word, you know, I, I feel helpless in trying to, to help people um, who are in a helpless situation, um, who, who feel helpless themselves. Um, so, so I would say that um, that's been uh, heavy uh, on my mind as, as I look at the different kinds of initiatives that we as a city have uh, either put forward or, or have asked others to put forward with us. And, and we're missing the mark in, in that those uh, services and those um, strategies that we have tried to deploy on the ground over the last couple of months haven't reached the, the outcomes that are expected uh, by the general public. Um, uh, I do know that some of those strategies probably take years to, to yield results. And, and I also know that that's not an answer people want. Um, no, nobody wants to hear that it's going to take years to get rid of gun violence at Elliott and 37th um, because, you know, uh, bullets are, are grazing by people's heads and, and now people are selling their homes and, and moving. Um, so I uh, personally just have struggled to really provide um, a, a rapid response to that in given the um, I guess the, the limitations of everything before us, whether it's a, a, a declining budget with COVID-19 pressures and uh, increasing demands on, on city um, and county services because of it. Um, clearly, um, I think our community is in a deep, um, uh, is still processing and, and feeling and, and working through the, the trauma that we all, um, visually saw and experienced with um, the, the, the killing of Mr. Floyd. And, and so I think that there, there is a, a collective holding of that trauma. And, um, and certainly I, I feel like a lot of the, the increase in, in, in some of that, um, that harm that we have seen throughout the city is connected to being a part of a collective moment of grief that, that we as individuals um, can't process alone. And, and we can't heal from alone. Um, so, so I see how our community is struggling and, and I feel that pain and, um, and, it, and it feels hard to not be able to be there for them in the way that, that one would want or, or that uh, technically a city um, can or, or can't be there for. So, um, so I, I also uh, lean on um, our police department who um, I know is led by a, a very reputable and, um, and trustworthy uh, individual uh, who I have you know, long uh, worked with and, uh, and have respect for and um, have really tried to, to figure out how do we um, shake uh, the, the white supremacy out of our departments 
whether it was, you know, acting like an organizer and, and calling for the disbandment of, of a department and creating a new one, or whether it was um, standing, you know, for and with uh, our chief and our mayor to, to try to provide um, short term and immediate uh, responses to some of the harm that we're seeing in our community. It, it's basically trying and testing any and all of the strategies that we can to try to um, get a handle on the moment. Um, so certainly um, not. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, I don't mean to. Well, I do. I guess I do mean to interrupt you, but sure. I just wanted yeah. to be okay. We Go appreciate. Ahead. Thank you. We appreciate <laughs> that response to that question. We have four others that we want to get through in quick succession and some of those I might table so we can get to some of the community questions that are stocking stacking up pretty quickly. Um, Chief Arandando, the next question I'm going to present to you and again if you could be as succinct as possible there's some resource questions also that will follow this and people really want to be able to hear as much as possible. Um, so please bear with me. So the next question, everyone, is what will be done to both address midterm, so before any new cadets or officers um, could hit the ground based on the mayor's proposed budget. So what will be done to both address midterm before additional resources, if you will, can be deployed um, and in, to combat increases in violence across the city, especially in North and South Minneapolis, and what is the plan for transforming the culture of the police force so that another George Floyd doesn't happen? So that's a two-parter chief, um, specifically about, can you give your best clearest answer on what can be done in the midterm before additional resources are deployed? And the second part is really about the transforming of the police department culture. Um, can you provide one or two clear examples of what that would look like? Uh, yes, uh, Director Montgomery, thank you for that. So for the immediate short term in terms of, or midterm, as you mentioned, about violent crime, that'll be the, that is clearly my focus right now is to try to get a handle on violent crime. So that will include um, the mutual aid assistance that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, that may also mean that we will have to uh, perhaps even do some triaging. And what I mean by triaging is that may mean working through our um, uh, emergency communications department, that may mean some calls, uh, finding uh, other areas or avenues where we can focus our officers on uh, obviously responding to the more high, higher priority calls and, and uh, seeing if there's others, agencies within the uh, Minneapolis, it may be more online reporting, but just making sure that we have adequate staffing to respond um, uh, to those, uh, those crimes or violent crime calls. Um, in terms of culture, um, uh, culture transformational change that we're working on, certainly that I'm working on right now. Uh, training is a huge part of that. Um, uh, training in the areas of uh, in, implicit bias training. Um, hiring is a key component to that, making sure that uh, uh, each new candidate that comes on um, has the character, has the, um, uh, the competency, cultural competency, uh, pre-employment um, psychological testing, those are those are some areas as well, but also engaging with our community members even before uh, that they take to our, our neighborhoods and patrol. And, and some of that has been done in volunteer work, um, whether that's uh, some of our academy, uh, recruit academy folks uh, going over to Bethany Community Center and putting up playground sets for uh, kids in the neighborhood, but really having that proximal relationship with community even prior to them uh, getting the badge and, and then being sworn in. So there's there's other pieces as well, but I'll, I'll pause there, uh, Director Montgomery. Thank you so much. And again, I don't mean to rush um, e any of you, um, but your efficiency and the responses are really appreciated. Mayor, given the question as presented, what role do you think that you you pose in support or in, um, in addition to or in contradiction to what the chief has put forward? What does the mayor's role um, entail in terms of the midterm helping to address safety, um, safety and specifically violent crimes? And um, what is your role as you see it in terms of helping to aid cultural shifts in the police department? Uh, excellent question. I'll, I'll try not to repeat too much of what the chief has said already and I'll try to be as, as quick as possible to get to the other questions. Um, so the chief and I are lockstep on this. Um, I, I want to first note, and, and this is in terms of police response in our 
response for safety is not limited to police, but it does include police. Normally on an annual basis, uh, we see about 40 to 45 officers uh, leave the department through attrition, either resignation or retirement. And the chief just mentioned this year, we've, are, we've seen around 172, that's around four times the number. Um, and so a number of different pieces that we've instituted to uh, provide to offset some of the loss. Uh, first, um, the chief and I made a difficult but necessary decision to shift units from within MPD to doing some of that necessary 911 response work and investigations. So we moved, for instance, the community engagement team or the police athletic league, a number of other units that were doing some incredible work to doing that traditional investigation, uh, intelligence gathering, and then yes, 911 response. Um, secondly, uh, the chief mentioned the uh, mutual aid pact, uh, getting additional assistance from outside jurisdictions in the interim before the three new recruiting classes will come on board for the next budget. Uh, I was very pleased to see that the, the vote move forward. It was something that we advocated hard for and we believe it. Um, uh, third, um, every precinct in the city has a plan that comes forward on a weekly basis to adjust uh, and be as efficient as possible in responding to what we're seeing on the ground. Um, I'm not gonna get into each one of the plans in the second and third and fourth and fifth precincts, but um, they, they, they exist and we would be happy to, to give you some of the, of the high points there. Um, and now getting into the culture shift and I'm, I'm moving quick here, uh, uh, but um, I'm, I'm trying to make sure we get to the other questions. There's more, more there that I haven't said. Um, culture shift. You know, I'm, Culture is, to a certain extent, about people. It's about personnel. And we have, a, we have a number of different policy changes that are moving forward that have already happened. You know, we, we revamped the use of force policy. We've required this de-escalation reporting. Um, we're, we revamped the body camera policy. We, we've done a number of different policy changes, but culture is not going to get shifted by policy changes alone. It just won't. Um, we need to have the ability to get the right individuals in and the wrong individuals out. The chief talked about how we get the right individuals in. And he, by the way, interviews every single one of them himself to make sure they're of the right mindset. They've got procedural justice instilled in the work they're doing. But here's the second part. Here's the second part that people need to hear, which is that we have uh, an arbitration system, a mandatory arbitration system at the state level that we have to go through. Uh, and when the chief or I choose to terminate or discipline an officer. That arbitration system, state law, has 50% of the officers that we terminate or discipline get sent right back to the department. So our decisions are overturned about 50% of the time. And the chief will tell you there's nothing more debilitating than that. And so as far as culture shift, we need to get the wrong ones out um, and, 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 and the right ones in. Uh, that is that is an essential part of, of what we're doing right now. Um, and but yes, in the, in the interim right now, we've got we've got it's adding to the officers. It's the safety beyond policing work with the Office of Violence Prevention, uh, which it's, it's group violence intervention, which is a whole nother initiative that I'd be happy to discuss. I'm cognizant of the time, so I'm going to I'm going to allow us to get to the next question. I thank you, Mayor. Um, so Council Member Connell, with your permission, unless there are additional insights that you wanna to offer to that particular question, if you will indulge me to move on to question three. And again, in the spirit of trying to get through as many questions as possible, um, this question is only really being directed at Chief Arandondo. Um, and it goes this way, Chief, um, now that an additional $500,000 um, has been added or to increase the number of police on the ground in the next two months based on the action that was taken. Um, what is the plan? Who are the partners and what will success look like? Yes, uh, Director Montgomery, thank you for the question. So the, the partners um, um, currently right now would be the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office. Uh, we've had uh, great assistance with the Metro, Metro Transit Police Department. Um, also, our, our state patrol has been helpful um, in, in dealing with other areas related to enforcement, particularly traffic enforcement, hot rodders, and, and, and what have you. Um, and uh, as we move into 2021, um, 
again, looking at what our resource, if we continue to uh, lose more resources here, we may have to open that up to other partners as well. But those at least uh, have been our partners. They were our partners back in 2014 when we started uh, uh, this detail. Uh, the, the plan for, for us and, and certainly for me as we move forward is to uh, stop the violence, stop the violent crime, to, to get a decrease in the shootings, to, to, uh, uh, to focus in through intelligence and, and, uh, and proactive enforcement uh, with the intelligence and data that we have, stop the carjackings, reduce the number of street robbers. Um, that is the focus of the plan as far as the tactics. Uh, those are things that our, our leadership teams will work out. But the plan is, and it's uh, make no doubt about it, the plan is very clear. We need to reduce the violence and trauma that our city is occurring, that our neighbors are witnessing. Um, it was, um, and I apologize, I may um, miss the name, Mrs. Odway talked about her neighbor being shot in the stomach. The plan is to, to stop and prevent and mitigate those types of occurrences from happening. And so uh, that's the plan is to reduce the, the violent crime that our city's our, our city's experiencing. Well, thank you, Chief. Um, and again, this is me acknowledging that we're off schedule, but that's okay. We're going to recover. We're going to, to table the additional questions that we had sent to you earlier and move directly to the community questions. Um, so please bear with me. I am aware, Mayor and Council Member, that this first question is for you. I'm just going to go to that particular screen here. Um, so the question goes about goes in this category. It's related to accountability. My question for Council Person Cano and Mayor Fry is how they plan on being accountable to communities, including unhoused people, people engaged in commercial sex, drug users, and people who are often unable to participate in meetings and public hearings, but people who have often expressed fear and concern over the actions of MPD. I'll read that really quickly one more time. Again, we know who the question is too. How do you plan on being accountable to communities, including unhoused people, people engaged in commercial sex, drug users, and people who are often unable to participate in meetings and public hearings, but people who have often expressed fear and concern over the actions of MPD. Um, Council Member Connell, I'll start with you. Thank you, uh, Tabitha. Um, I'll say that that's a, a really difficult question um, because typically a, a traditional response would say, well, the, the way that elected officials are accountable are accountable at, at the ballot box Everybody knows there's elections next year for city council and the mayor's office. So folks would typically vote their values out uh, there, um, campaign for different um, individuals or candidates to try to, to get them to uh, pay attention to the issues that they care the most. Um, it's, it's unclear you know, how many um, uh, residents who are experiencing homelessness uh, can vote or do vote. Uh, the same thing for uh, the women uh, who are being um, exploited in, um, in the commercial sexual exploitation that we all know is a part of Lake Street uh, daily, uh, you know, how many of them would vote or participate. So then um, if, if that mechanism is not available, which I think, you know, in fact is available to many of the, of the folks uh, who are privileged enough to, to be able to speak for those communities and on behalf of those communities experiences, you know, they can uh, take it to the ballot box. Um, so if we don't, let's assume we don't have that mechanism available, um, we, I, I would say that we should shift our energy and our focus to the nonprofit organizations that the city and the county fund to support those communities uh, to be able to have more representation, help and support and, um, and autonomy. Um, so for example, um, I think this year alone, the city of Minneapolis have, has given at least $80,000 to Inquilinos Unidos to help us with housing issues and housing solutions. So it would be a matter of uh, the city sitting down with that group and, and working through the issues of uh, representation for those communities so those communities can speak for themselves and act for themselves um, and, and let us know. Um, you know, how they wish to be, uh, uh, I guess, supported and, and um, um, you know, a problem, problem solving with those specific communities. We also uh, have a, a very big contract with St. Stephen's. Um, in the past, we have also funded the Family Partnership as well as the Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center. 
Um, there are many, many nonprofit organizations that the city uh, funds to, to try to help us achieve those goals of accountability, representation, uh, voice, empowerment. Um, so I think it would be um, the most uh, tangible vehicle that I can think of is to convene all of those uh, stakeholders and talk about how uh, we're reaching those goals or how we're not reaching those goals and troubleshoot. Uh, because I think sometimes uh, the groups that we fund uh, are in direct opposition to the work that the city's trying to do. And so what you have is, is sort of this conflict in mission and direction and strategies and tactics and goals. And, and then we don't get anywhere because there's, you know, the, the cart is being pulled in a hundred different directions. And so we're not able, able to have that collective impact. Um, so that's, that's what I would say is, is my response. Great, thank you so much. Mayor Fry, can you, uh, again, do you have any additional thoughts to provide in terms of what do you believe your accountability is to persons who, for all intents and purposes, are not going to participate in a forum like this? I think that we need to be exceedingly accountable, especially to those that are struggling most. Um, and, and those that are struggling most, especially through this pandemic, uh, are, are unhoused, are, are unsheltered, and are, are experiencing homelessness in one fashion or another. Um, and there's a number of things that we are working on right now on that front. You know, first I'll say, you know, the city has invested about three times the, the previous record in deeply low income and affordable housing. Um, and, you know, a, a shelter is temporary, but what we need to be focused on is long-term and stable housing. That is a, a, has, is a priority. Uh, it is a, is a passion of mine. Um, and, you know, I'm proud that, that we've dramatically, dramatically increased the amount of low income housing that we've, that we've been putting online. Is it enough? No, it's not. Uh, we need to do more. Um, but, you know, pushing things three times the previous record is a start. Next, um, shelter. You know, we have uh, prioritized kind of two overarching pieces through uh, COVID-19 through this pandemic, which, by the way, also has a dramatic impact on our city revenues and resources. And the two big pieces we prioritize are one, uh, continuing to deliver core city services with excellence, you know, be that plow in the street or safety. Um, and secondly, we want to help those who are struggling most first. Uh, and so we've, we're adding three new additional shelters that are coming online. Uh, one, which is culturally sensitive and specific to our, our native community. Um, the, the, the second, we're, we're still finding the location, but we're hoping to get um, a women's specific shelter um, in, in some form and, and, and looking again, looking for the location. Uh, the, the third is kind of end of life care. But then the fourth, the fourth is, is, is an area where we have been and should be directly accountable to those experiencing homelessness, which is a new and transformational model, uh, which is our indoor community villages. These are essentially small and tiny homes in a overarching warehouse that allows warmth. It allows your own space. That's a big thing. It gives people the, the dignity and respect in their own space um, where they're able to have those kind of basic necessities around them. Um, and and, and that, is, that is perhaps a new model that I, I you know, again, we're moving forward with it right now. We've been expediting the process. It's under construction at the moment. Um, and we hope to get people in uh, very shortly. And so a number of different things we're working on. And that's in addition to the outreach, the health services, the harm reduction, uh, and the work in conjunction with Hennepin County, which is but the tra traditionally Hennepin County does social services for those who are experiencing homelessness and runs our homeless shelter system. The city has needed to step up in a big way uh, over the last couple of years. Thank you, Mayor. Again, just as a reminder, I'm going to do a time check. I know we can lose sight of that. We have 15 minutes left. We still have over 275 people on the call. We certainly believe that they want to hear more of the community questions. So again, I implore you to the best of degree that you're able, if you can keep your responses um, clear and brief. Um, the next one is related to effectiveness of police. I am I'm positioning this to Mayor Fry and Chief Arredondo. Um, Mayor, I'm going to start with you and then we'll go over to the Chief. Um, it goes this way. We talk about the uptick as the crisis, which assumes the former level, the former level was acceptable or competent public safety. That was the level when we had full patrol staffing. That was the level where a certain level of young black death by gun relegated to North Minneapolis is assumed to be normal. I don't see before the uptick as competent public safety. 
So what specific evidence slash data would you point me towards to indicate that getting us to full staffing patrol levels means safety for me in North Minneapolis? I am not going to reread that. I think the spirit of the question hopefully is clear because it was long. Mayor Fry. Thank you. Well, first, police are not going to be able to do it on their own. Um, that, that, is, that is not a, an, an overarching solution in and of itself. Um, you need stable housing, you need opportunity, you need jobs, you need um, transparency and visibility, you need better lighting. There's a number of different facets that ultimately can have an, an, an impact on crime. Um, and there's you know, psychological trauma and mental health and everything else that, that also, um, and, and addiction, addiction. Um, and so to, to say that a police officer should deal with, with all of those issues is, is, is incorrect. And I think it sets them up for failure. Um, they are certainly a, a part of, of the equation. Um, and we've been, and, and our, the chief can talk about this in a second, but we've been situating the department to, so it's not just, sim, it's not just a pure and simple um, 911 response. It, it, it's, we, we want an officers who are involved with community. We want to develop some of these deep relationships so that when problematic situations do arise, they're better able to account for them. And um, we've also added programs um, and, and increased and enhanced those programs. And, and one great example I'll give you is, G, is GVI. GVI is our Group Violence Intervention Initiative. And what this program does is it brings individuals who are gang involved or gang adjacent um, in for a, a call in. And at that call in, you have a number of people that are there. You, you have myself, you have Chief Arredondo, um, you have perhaps the US Attorney, um, you have uh, uh, community members um, that care deeply about their, their streets, um, and um, you even have family. And a, a very clear message is delivered. And, and that message is, you know, if you put down the guns, if you stop the violence, then we will offer every possible resource to you, whether that's housing or, or a job will we'll give you opportunity. However, if you don't put down the guns, uh, we will have a very clear and direct response as well. Um, and and the, the gangs that shoot first or shoot most, um, the individuals that are responsible, yes, you know, we're going to make sure that they are held accountable because we cannot have this kind of violence, this kind of shooting on our streets. It's been, what it is is a very strategic and precise mechanism to target those that are causing most of the gun violence and the violence in our communities. Um, and yeah. so finding new ways. And so Chief, Chief can elaborate a little bit on some of the strategic work there, but um, um, yes, go for it, Chief. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Chief, the, the last part of the question, I'll just re restate. So what specific evidence slash data would you point me towards to indicate that getting us to full staffing patrol levels means safety for me in North Minneapolis? How would you respond to that question? Well, I would say, Director Montgomery, that I have not believed that we have been at adequate staffing level for many years. I went before our uh, elected officials and tried to report on data uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, when at that time, uh, our priority one calls, 6,776 times we did not have a squad car readily available to respond then when we had more officers then. And so uh, clearly uh, we're having to deal with catch up right now. So I, um, um, we, we need to, to muster up as many resources as we can to just deal with the violent crime. Um, and um, we need to get a, a, a handle and a grip on that. Um, and, and part of that, again, that caller or that the, the person who asked the question, um, the reassurance will come from us reducing, trying to reduce this violent crime in that manner. But uh, clearly, we need those resources to be able to respond to that violent crime. Thank you so much, Chief. And I do appreciate the brevity. But I, uh, sadly, if you could come back on, the next question is for you. Um, it's related to the union. Um, and it goes this way. Have contract negotiations with police with the police union resumed, will these negotiations be used as leverage to implement reform or oversight mechanisms? And how can the community influence the arbitration process? That's a three-part question. Yeah, uh, Director Montgomery, so I'll try to- I, mean, I, I can, I'll restate the first one and then I'll pop back in. So have contract negotiations with the police union resumed? Um, they have not resumed at this time, um, but at some point in time, they, they certainly will. Uh, 
Yes. Okay. And then the second part was, will these negotiations be used as leverage to implement reform or oversight mechanisms? Uh, uh, the first part, um, abs I absolutely want to see uh, something new, something different in those contracts. And so that is certainly a goal of mine. As far as the oversight, there's a different mechanism at play, and that's outside of the contract. And uh, currently we have an Office of Police Conduct Review, which is an oversight mechanism that we currently have in place that replaced the former Civilian Review Authority that was uh, dissolved back in um, November of 2012. And so that is separate from the, the, the contract um, um, at this point in time. Okay. Thank you, um, Chief. And I'm going to go to Mayor Fry. This last part of the question related to the union for you to protect, um, share your thoughts around how can the community influence the arbitration process from your perspective? So I might need to clarify the question. There's the arbitration process, which is, is embedded in state law. And then there's the union and collective bargaining agreement, which is what we're, we're we will be going through in, ter in terms of negotiations. They're, they're, they're different. Um, and so, you know, one, I think we've heard quite a bit from community uh, regarding the necessity of changing the underlying collective bargaining agreement and pushing back on, on the police federation in a big way. We, we hear you loud and clear. We agree. Um, uh, we, this, 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 this doesn't need to be, this, this, this needs to be a fully um, revamped contract. Um, you know, it, it's, it's about getting to a place where we've got, a, 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 you know, the, the, and the chief, the chief has taken great efforts in this to, to make sure that we're not just like nibbling around the edges, uh, but we're looking for a, not just a new contract, but like a new compact with community in terms of moving forward with this collective bargaining agreement. Um, and so I can't really go into detail uh, about, about some of the pieces for, we, we're not allowed to for legal reasons. Um, uh, but that is happening. The arbitration piece is a state law. Um, and and, and I, I do feel strongly that that needs to change. I feel strongly that, you know, when the chief or I terminate somebody for, for instance, egregious use of force or lying on a formal document, um, that they should stay terminated or disciplined. Um, and, and having that decision returned to us is, is not helpful. And I think that that's going to be one of the big fronts for, for, for this, this, this fight for progress and culture shift is right there. And so I strongly encourage everybody to get involved with us. Thank you, Mayor Fry. We are at 724. I believe this is likely gonna be the last question. I would encourage everyone to stick with us um, as this question is read and as it's responded to and for the closing comments so that we can again appreciate everybody's participation in tonight's um, conversation. Um, Council Member Connell, this question is for you. Um, can you clarify what some people are perceiving as a contradiction in your statement that you are no longer a reformer and your actions to support additional funding for MPD in 2020 or other actions that seem to indicate working with MPD? Yes, I apologize. I had to turn on my uh, video. Yeah, I think it's important for folks to to know. I think a lot of people probably don't know that when we, as the as the five co-authors of the charter amendment, were putting together our question to create a new Department of Public Safety, we explicitly uh, decided to include a division of law enforcement, and that's because um, I am a person that believes we still need to enact arrests, and that we still need jails and prisons. And um, I know that's going to feel horrible for many, many folks, uh, but I unfortunately I don't get to live in the sort of clean philosophical world that, that we want to build. I, I have to live in the world that is still very much uh, conflicted and, and, and gray and gritty, uh, where a lot of different voices um, uh, are, are in disagreement about how um, their experiences um, uh, reflect uh, relationships and um, and, and actions in the world. So um, when we authored the charter amendment that we then proposed to the charter commission, we explicitly said we wanted to be able to have the authority to enact uh, a law enfor enforcement division, which was uh, something that uh, a lot of the community organizers who were lobbying us uh, for um, the complete um, abolishment of the department did not like. 
And so early on this summer, we had that disagreement. And I, I'm sure that was a quiet disagreement that only a, a select number of people were privy to. Um, many of you likely saw the question that came forward. And, um, and we never really unpacked that uh, divide between some of the organizers and the council members in that some folks didn't want us to conduct arrests. And, um, and a lot of us as council members said, we absolutely need to be able to conduct arrests in 2020, in 2021, in 2022, and perhaps more um, until we defeat capitalism, which is the source of a lot of the, um, uh, the harms that we see replicated in our, in our community. So, so from that stance, um, I, I guess I would just um, illuminate uh, that pattern to then share that I, I personally do have a lot of beliefs and values that I cannot enact as a council member. Um, it, there is a difference between me as, as a personal uh, woman and mother and, um, and worker and immigrant and the votes that I have to take on the council because I have the responsibility of, of caring for and, and supporting 30,000 residents. So, so it's, it's, not like, um, it's not a very selfish thing, this job. You really do have to figure out what is uh, the best way to uh, maintain and sustain a community ecosystem that advances and moves forward. And, and I very much respond to the, um, the present um, uh, needs before me. And so when uh, Mr. Floyd was, uh, was killed, I very much uh, reacted and acted like an organizer, which is a, an identity that I have carried for a long time and that's uh, inherently who I am. And I would say that now I'm acting like a policymaker because I see that there are 200 immigrant owned businesses on Lake Street who are struggling and who need help and who are scared and who uh, don't feel heard. And so I need to be able to ebb and flow between those identities and those spaces to be able to maintain a, a balance in how the work is done. And so while I myself believe that we can live in a world where we don't have police and where we can um, uh, reduce harm and address harm in a way that doesn't involve uh, a gun or an arm, I, I also know that uh, you know Donald Trump was our president uh, or still is uh, until we can formally get uh, Mr. Biden in the door. I, I also realize that if a white supremacist were to come to my home and kill my family, I would want that white supremacist arrested. I'm not going to send them to a retreat to you know Madeline Island. Um, so I think it's really important for folks to really look back. And, and look forward and, and understand that we have a very diverse community who's not there with us. And we have to do the hard work to get there together um, before we can start to assume that certain things will be happening. Thank you for your response. Um, and Mayor Fry and Council Member Connell, if you could keep your picture up and Chief Arandondo, if you could come back. We really do appreciate you being with us this evening. Um, thank you community um, truly for wonderful questions. The only thing I wanted to say before I turn it back over to Kathy Spann from Jack is to indicate that we had well over seven pages of either comments and or questions. We don't expect after we send them to you that you might have the bandwidth to be able to respond in writing to all of them. But I definitely believe that the community would appreciate you putting your eyes on them, that they would appreciate you reading through them, that you hold them in mind as you continue to try to make the decisions in service of this community. They would deeply appreciate at least your commitment by a head nod of being able to take 15 minutes to do that. Seven pages of questions and or comments that we did not get to with nearly 300 people in the community that you serve participating. Kathy, over to you. Thank you. I wanna thank everyone that is on this call this evening. And it is clear to me that we have a lot of work to do. Um, state of our beloved city of Minneapolis. And I'm just gonna do a recap and then I'm gonna ask um, of the mayor and the chief, I'm gonna ask them one very last question. The state of our beloved city of Minneapolis, we have 74 dead. We have 500 plus people that have been shot. Our city is really bleeding. Uh, we know that there are five things that came out of this meeting tonight. Number one, deep structural change in the Minneapolis Police Department cultural needs to be done. Police response has to be different. Uh, Three, legacy, this is a legacy shaping moment and community and government working together is key. The objective is reduce violence and the level of trauma. Right now, plan is really stop the violence, 
stop the shooting, stop the carjacking, and stop the robberies. I want to tell you guys this, that you are really the change that you want to see. This is your city. This is your Minneapolis. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So what I am going to ask of the mayor and of the chief of Minneapolis is that $500,000 has been allocated for literally seven weeks from now to 12-31-2020. I'm gonna ask you what steps will you do to improve ongoing communications related to public safety to communicate back to the community what is happening in regards to the objective to reduce violence and the level of trauma. I'm gonna ask you that in 30 days that you come back to this community, the citizens of, Re of uh, the residents of Minneapolis, that you come back to us in 30 days to actually give a report before the end of the year. And that I'm gonna ask even more, that you meet and you give us a communication plan every single week that tells us what is being done. And I'm just gonna ask that of you. And is that doable? Chief, mayor, either one can go. Uh, Ms. Spam, thank you for that. Um, absolutely, I can work with our communications teams to uh, uh, put out, we, we typically put out regular updates regarding uh, crime throughout our city, but as it relates specifically from now until the year end, I can absolutely provide some updates in terms of where we are uh, from a citywide perspective. Um, we can certainly break it down from neighborhoods um, and to give updates in terms of where, where we are. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And we'd be happy to do that, uh, Ms. Spann. Um, we'd be happy to do it because, you know, we need to be disseminating that information as much as possible. And, you know, the, the chief talked about, you know, the, the, the plan of, of stopping the gun violence and, and preventing some of these crimes from happening before they started. He, he talked about stopping the, the homicides. Now, I want you to also know there, there, he couldn't get into it in detail, but there are, are specific plans for every precinct every neighborhood at times, you know, there's, it even goes down to the block. Um, so that, that's an important piece that I just wanted to, to recognize. Um, and, you know, we can't get into all of that right here on this call, right. but, but there are very discreet and defined plans around that. Um, and so, yeah, we, we will be providing additional information. We'd be happy to come back and report again to you um, uh, because, you know, you, you all are doing some extraordinary work in, in organizing here and it's just so good. It's so good to see, you know, North Siders, South Siders rallying together around a common cause, which is, which is safety uh, and is true change. So thank you. Excellent. And with that, knowing that by December 17th in 30 days from today, the mayor and the chief of police have made a commitment to come back to the community and the citizens of re and residents of Minneapolis to give an update on what is happening. I wanna thank everyone that has joined us this evening because once again, you are the change that you want to see. This is your city, this is your Minneapolis. We wanna thank you this evening and I say good night and happy holidays. So nothing really. Bye everyone. Bye Kathy. I text you as well. Yep. <laughs> Jamila, thank you for joining us this evening. We have a lot of work to do. Yes, we're not yes. done. <laughs> we're not done. We have a lot of work hey, to do.